license to expropriate land without compensation. So let's, let's go. Yeah, let's go. Mm. <laughs> uh, let's let's have a clear framework to introduce free education. Let's drop the stem from the national anthem. Mm. We 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 did the uh, we we engaged openly with them. Then, which one was the most thing. difficult? Because <laughs> uh, it seems yeah, like they this, are pretty no, obvious these things. Uh, uh, they said everything is difficult. <laughs> they said everything is difficult. Are you are you are you not difficult with the stem? And I, I asked this. From, let me hear your perspective. Are you not saying? Uh, as a united front, South Africa has agreed to bring everyone together in, in, in a, and you're saying remove this. We is united. It's, 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 it's Whites and black people. Whites and black people. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, those things were fictions. Like, there the, the, was a fuss. Like, uh, but also, how do you take the song of your oppressors, like, which was used to celebrate Rainbow Nation. The murder. No, you know where we're from. No, it was a Rainbow no, Nation it's, it's, it's ambition. That, those things are absolute rubbish. Those things which those people did in Kodesa are absolute rubbish. Mm. If anything that we want to re reverse ourselves is those Kodesa agreements. They, they were sellout positions in terms of how they got to construct this democratic project. Mm. So I mean, like Mandela, that is why, you know. If there was really meaningful achievement that was brought by Mandela, it was going to be a factor every day. It's only white people who are celebrating Mandela now. Black people even forget that there's Mandela. Mm. But all the youth, they don't even associate with him. Yeah. Like, because there's nothing which really we can uh, say is the father of the nation. He brought us freedom and all of those things. Because those things that they've agreed to in Kodesa were absolute rubbish. The Mandela era, highly celebrated all over the world. Yes. And you seem to question, not necessarily the era, but what happened before the 27th of April. The conversations that led to the free country that we got. What, what are some of your fundamental issues with that? No, you know, uh, you know the, there was this, a lot of um, strategic retreats on mostly economic policy issues. Mm. So the liberation movement, mostly the ANC, capitulated to the demands of domestic and global capitalists as well as to what should happen, what should constitute a new South Africa. Mm -hmm. Mostly it was to say, guys, just take political power. The economy we are going to continue to control. Uh, for, and some coincidentally, you know, I wrote my master's advocates about the economic policy discussions okay. and deliberations <laughs> during the period 1990-1994. So you've had to engage this yeah. intimately. So, yeah. And it's not fiction, actually. Like, mm. we illustrate even in the master's uh, <laughs> thesis that Mandela was having a recurrent meeting with um, Harry Oppenheimer to talk about the economic policies of uh, South Africa. So as part of my research project, I interviewed uh, Bobby Godsell, mm. who was a uh, part of the Oppenheimer Empire. And I also interviewed a guy called Clem Santa. And they were frank. No, they were frank that, no, we used to meet, we said, no, those were actually very useful discussions because we used to meet with Seher Oppenheimer and Nelson Mandela and uh, we we work into details of how the economy should look like and everything mm -hmm. else there. So it was actually a very good thing that we did. Mm -hmm. And remember, like, the Oppenheimers, like, through Clem Santa had said in 1987 that in the ultimate end, negotiations must work, rhetoric must be dropped, and we must continue to do business as usual. And that is what they got to achieve ultimately. And and to show the the basic illustration of how... We there was a sellout position on the economy. It's the composition of present Mandela's cabinet, right? The Minister of Land was Cry van Nikerk <laughs> from the apartheid government. The Minister of Minerals was Big Water. Government of National Unity. Yeah, no, they they no, had no, to I, bring I, guys I, in. Okay, that's fine. You're saying no, no, look unity. at the positions. No. And then the Minister of Finance was Derek Keys. Yes. And I was succeeded by Limbenberg as well. Like um, from Nedbank, was was forwarded from Nedbank. Mm. And, um, and then they had the deputy president of uh, the clerk and obviously uh, Tabo. But they safeguarded the economic sectors because once you say minerals, land, and the minerals component also include the petroleum resources mm. and then finance, what are you left with? 
Your lib <laughs> good lib. Sports and lib. <laughs> See, you're a minister of lib. Yes. Like, uh, and health. And you can't, and you're not doing what anything. What did we have? Like, health. Uh, what did we have? Health. Like, <laughs> anyway. like the, I think health was Nkosaza. Nkosaza, yeah. that's the, yeah. that's the era where cigarettes had, uh, yes, yeah. the advertising the, ended. Yes. But the key economic sectors. Yeah were led by the same people. And once they were sure that uh, our agenda is is solid, yeah, it won't be disturbed, they allowed black people to continue play the puppet role which they had already designed. So mm. the Codessa outcomes are nowhere close to revolutionary. And that is why majority of black people remain poor. That is why South Africa is the most unequal society in the world. It actually did apartheid mm. in terms of levels of inequality. Hmm. Apartheid, where legislation was making it unlawful for black people to own economic sectors, it's outdone by the so-called democratic state in terms of the extent of inequalities because white people just got richer and black people got poorer. Hmm. Uh, and the, the gap is way too much. And, and there is no creation of a black bourgeoisie or capitalist class. One can say that there is a, a rise in, in middle class that happened since 94. And mostly, obviously, it's amongst black people. It's 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 underwhelming rise, actually. Mm. It's an underwhelming rise. I, I mean, like, if we're to... I mean, we're, we're going to talk about China now. We, we the, will have to. I mean, if you were to check what is the rise of the middle class is, it has to be more than 50% of the population, if you want to talk about significant changes. Mm. Like China, correctly, including the the, the UN uh, development program, like UNDP, and the United Nations acknowledge the fact that China is responsible for poverty reduction, of, of global poverty reduction at 70% of the poverty reduced because it took more than 700 million out of mm. absolute poverty. So, and, and the creation of more than 400 million middle class. You know when you got 400 million middle class component? Mm, mm. It's people with disposable income and buying power. True. That is a huge economic base. I don't think South Africa, we, we are anywhere close to that. The numbers are nowhere close to satisfactory. That is why we're not a significant market for anything. What made you want to study another master's? I did the research proposal first okay. here in South Africa for a PhD. Okay. And uh, so, you know, in South Africa, the manner in which the research proposals are done is that you do a research proposal, you go and defend it in the in front of academics, and then they give you a go-ahead to write the PhD. Mm, mm. I'm going through that. Yes. <laughs> I haven't, my, so I'm in still the, in the process of yeah, putting it together. Yeah, and then you write, then you submit. Mm. So the Vet School of Governance said, I'd, I'd already defended my... Okay, your submission. Yeah, yeah. and I was going to write about the nature of South African capitalism as well. Like, it was, was going to be very interesting. I, <laughs> that, was, that was inspired by a Angels, Frederick Angels' PhD, which was the conditions of the working class in England. So I was okay. like, okay, let's write something about... Then in the process of writing, I actually wrote a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Then I was like, I think I need more practical experience one with the politics of South Africa, but also with government mm. to could contribute something much more meaningful as okay. a PhD. Mm. Like, I think it's too early to could write a PhD because PhD must be addition to knowledge. It must be out of practical observation mm. of what have you learned uh, mm. in society, in practice. Like, if you're going to write about industrial policy and everything, else, you should have been able to say, this is what I've guided in relation to industrial policy and mm. all of those. Mm. So mm. I, I then I was like, it, it, it's premature to could pursue that route. Then I was like, let me then choose to do a, a master's program to strengthen uh, your yeah your ambitions. My, my, my ambitions later on to do a PhD, but then the criteria for me was that I must do a, a master's in a, one of the top 10 universities in the world. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. I was about to ask, why choose the <laughs> University of London? So I no, I had actually, uh, uh, I had said like, what, whichever department that I had said, because I was like, let's test if these <laughs> theories that we have and ideas that we have uh, 
can be tested at a, at a far much larger scale and everything else. But also, I couldn't do, I was thinking that, you know, the PhD which I defended was with the Vets Governance School. Mm. I was like to have four degrees from one university is not okay. Or oh, yeah. you wanted to yeah widen your scope. Then during the COVID period, what then happened was that I then decided that I'm going to to enroll for a master's program. Then mm. I said before I do that, let me enroll for a three month uh, short course. I, then I I I enrolled with the London School of Economics first okay. for a three months. Short mm. course. Somebody lied and said they got a PhD at London School. Of yeah, it's one of the, the <laughs> board members. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that I did a short course like for three months, and mm. then then the average which I got was seventy nine point two percent, like of the course on globalization and the global okay. economy and politics, and. Mm. Then I gained some confidence. I was like, ah, oh, this thing is not very difficult. <laughs> LSE is raving about a lot, and mm, mm. let me then go mainstream. Then I enrolled for for the uh, Masters of Science in International Development from yeah. SOAS Development Studies School. So, you know, the University of London, it's a very huge university. It has got upward of 200,000 students. Oh. But then within the University of London, they've got semi-autonomous schools and departments. SOAS being one of them. Yeah, SOAS being one of them. London School of Economics is one of them as well. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So, there's a lot of uh, prominent universities within. within the university. Wow. I think, by the way, we should model that maybe for one of the universities, either Vets University or University of Johannesburg in South Africa, where... You find that, with, though? With yeah. Gordon, Gordon, what is it, Gibbs? I think, is, uh, I think I think we must make it far much bigger. I yeah. think we must have the, the quantitative expansion of Vets or UG mm. to go 100,000 plus students, like... And then with smaller universities within yes, within yes yeah. so that we create a farm I'm, I don't understand why we have not by now turned the entire Brown Fontaine Oakland Park into area. a student yeah into a, an, a research and academic city yeah or suburb or where because it's it's moving that way in, on its own yes in and, some then, way. and then and then and then what we do as well there we then remove the fences into universities so that we can have truly open education such that if you are staying around there even if you are not enrolled into a class, mm -hmm. you can say, let me attend the course on sociology, like just one lecture, but mm. you must pre-inform the university that I just want to learn this component and then I go, I'm not enrolled, but let me, wow. just allow me. We must have open mm. universities like that. Mm. By and large, by the way, like, there are no real strong fences there in the <laughs> University of London complex. Yeah, like, so just... yeah. Wow. There's no access control. Where are you going? Mm -mm. Who are you going to see? No. It's how did almost you do open. it practically? Were you the, there a lot? No. So they have got extremely advanced online education systems mm. where you attend classes like and put on your laptop and must be physically there. Like they verify that it's you. Mm. Even when you're writing exams, like you, we, you can write exam, they open one page where you're writing only, right? Mm. First thing they must survey where you are that there is nothing else there. Okay, wow. And then the, the question comes as and when you answer them, right? Okay. You there lower the screen, it's gone forever. You will never... You, or you, you... If you lower the screen yes. from when once it opens there, it's gone forever. You will not be able to write because they will think that you're now copying and everything. Oh... <laughs> yeah, they've got very strong, like highly advanced uh, online education uh, systems. Yeah. So I did coursework, I did three courses, and then I did a, a research paper. Mm. And the coursework was not easy. Was what was easy. it? What What were the courses? The course I did was one was called the the sociology and politics of global economy. Okay. The other one was called uh, understanding poverty. There's a huge course on understanding poverty, mm, which is actually mm. very insightful. Like, yeah. on on it actually reveals that most of the poverty measurements that we use in South Africa are, are problematic. We just use monetary components without mm. looking into the multi-dimensional expressions of poverty. Mm. And then I did a course on uh, economics, politics, and society in East Asia. Are they prerequisites a part of the the masters in science degree? Or they were separate from that? They? 
Are they part of the Yeah, it's part the of the space. Yeah, it's part of the MSC. Yeah. Like the, the reason why they call it Master of Science is because they know that they've trained you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. The it's you can have some scientific value out of uh, what but it was not easy. Like uh, <laughs> it was very difficult. It always looks easy when it's done. Yeah. The, <laughs> Do you know this uh, uh, an assignment which a lot of people got to drop out from the program because mm. of like um, they said during COVID, like towards the end of COVID, they say, can you please uh, write uh, eight thousand words of analyzing the incidents of COVID and the responses of the governments of the following countries, which you don't choose yourself. Okay, say, Ghana, Germany. Mexico, mm. I think the last one was Nicaragua, right? Mm. Mm. And then the three don't have English literature. Like, Yar. Where do you start? And, <laughs> yeah, then you like, where do I get information about Germany and Mexico? And mm. I had to look for translation services and uh, apps wow. and everything as there to be able to. That can help you. Yeah. I, a lot of people stopped. They said that ah, this is you are taking us too far now. Do you do you find and then but I was able to like enjoy but at some stage I was like is this worth it I was about to ask yeah. did you find at some point you wanted to give up like others yeah at some stage I was like hey this is a and remember I start this coursework and everything as during the COVID lockdowns right so that time I'm, I've got maximal time and everything mm, else. Mm. but then the program is not a year it's two years okay then the reopening happens Mm. Like the of the country. Okay, and now you have you you have to work. Now I must. Yeah, <laughs> there was a sauna debate where I think one of the saunas I was submitting an assignment. Mm. I had to literally <laughs> break a laptop <laughs> from outside when they were presenting. You were submitting hey. during sauna yeah. in parliament. Yeah, the, what the <laughs> even when I submitted the final dissertation, I was actually in Kigali. Mm. In Rwanda, attending the interparliamentary unions uh, assembly, like how did you manage pitch? though to make? So time? I work differently, like uh, myself. Like mm. in, so I work at night, like I, I work in the evening. Like I start yeah. at twelve in the evening, yeah. and I push until four or five in the morning, mm. like, where there is no disturbances of phone calls and all of those. Complete other silence. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Complete you silence. may have noticed I. <laughs> I send you something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. That is how that is how I operate. So I yeah. So many people will like will see that things that I've written, but they've never seen me typing anything on a laptop. So I was I about to ask. Yeah. When do you do it? So eh? I do, and and then the other thing as well, which was very difficult during winter, is that I'm unable to write under a roof. Okay, explain. I must see the sky everywhere. I read. So I must have to sit what? outside. Yeah. So you work outside. Yeah. If it's a place, there must be a balcony or there must be. An what led to here. that? What is that? I I don't know. Like I can't. Like um, <laughs> I become extremely jittery and panicky when. What? It's I a wonder. close off place. Yeah. I wonder where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>